Pierce Carlos Sagan introducing another one of my programs. In today's program, I will explore briefly the early beginnings of Frank Zappa, the leader of the famed Mothers of Invention. Of all the figures that uh, made the rock revolution of the 1960s possible, one of them that I most admire is Frank Zappa, and for several reasons. One is because he's a genuine pioneer in avant-garde musical style. Another reason is his honesty and moral sense that led him to become one of the most acerbic critics against hypocrisy in all levels of American society, establishment, liberal, hip, left and right, and so on. And also another reason is his Renaissance attitude that goes way beyond music. He very early introduced some very novel visual and cinematic effects in concerts. He also became very concerned with acoustics and sound recording techniques. And in the sociological aspect, he was perhaps the first one to understand the importance and fully document that phenomenon of the groupies. And really, I would not be surprised if 20, 40, or 50 years from now, Frank Zappa were studied with the same interest that we now show for people such as Varese, Cage, or even Charles Ives. I think it is very interesting and revealing, too, to recall my first contact with Frank Zappa long before the Mothers of Invention and long before he became what you might call a freak. The year was 1963. I was a newcomer in Los Angeles and I was avidly looking for and feeling, sensing the avant-garde in Los Angeles. And I was also producing my very first programs for KPFK, the Pacifica Foundation outlet in Los Angeles. Very soon I realized that the avant-garde was not to be found along the famed La Cienega Boulevard or in the sadly and rapidly decaying beat scene of Venice, but mostly was to be found in often obscure, unexpected places. And thus is how I was attracted to the fifth annual contemporary musical symposium that was held in the spring of that year at a small but very open-minded Catholic liberal college of West Los Angeles, Mount St. Mary's College. And that was virtually the only place in Los Angeles that opened its doors to Frank Zappa and his novel musical and visual experiments of, you might call, experimental, aleatory, electronic, visual music. I became very fascinated with these early experiments of Frank Zappa, and I recall that I brought to KPFK all of the tapes of that uh, festival. Well, KPFK in the early 60s was very much what you might call a sort of liberal establishment institution. Musically, for example, the only accepted music was classical, jazz, folkloric, and a few well-known electronic composers. Other kinds of music were not proper, you might say and were seldom, if ever, played. Well, those tapes that I made in that festival that contained chamber, baroque, or uh, conventional classical music were played on prime time. But the tapes of Frank Zappa were shelved. Only after my constant requests my constant pressure, finally, but very grudgingly, they agreed to play them, but it was done in the worst time and with all of the commentaries deleted. 
And this was a sort of foretaste of what Frank Zappa would have to face later. Because Frank Zappa has had very bad luck indeed with radios, recording companies, and even the public. It is true that he had some relative public acceptance during the heyday of the hip movement among hip underground audiences. But mostly I find it because of their antics, the, you might call, freakiness of the ensemble. But the very remarkable artistic, musical, and social message was way ahead of his time and generally way above the heads of the audiences. But worse even, Frank Zappa, being part of that generation of the 1950s, was caught in that whole syndrome of the silent generation, McCarthyism, the Eisenhower years. He was caught in a traditional 1950s marriage that ended in failure. And despite his obvious talent, he was rejected by virtually all the academic musical circles and ended up having to earn a meager living doing some menial technical jobs or writing some uh, popular songs. And to top it all, he was victim of, you might say, the blue nose censorship of those years. He was busted by the police and mercilessly prosecuted because he had produced what they called a sort of porno soundtrack. A soundtrack so tame by present day standards that he could not even qualify for an X rating. So, if you think about all of this and combine all of these elements with a very talented, pioneering, intense personality, you will get a clue of the anger, loneliness, frustration Frank Zappa often felt and expressed openly in some of his public appearances. A loneliness, anger, frustration, I might add, not too different from what I, from what many of us feel now faced with the almost surrealistic monstrosities of the society that surrounds us. So it's no wonder that Frank Zappa became one of the most outrageous, acerbic, artistic spokesmen and critics of social and moral criticism of the rock revolution of the 1960s. Lillian Rockson, the author of the famed Encyclopedia of Rock, says in part, talking about Frank Zappa and his Mothers of Invention, their first album, Freak Out, was unlike anything that was happening in American music in 1966. Freak Out was not just social and musical satire. It was the first rock album produced as if it were a single piece of music. And it was a full year before the Beatles made this concept commercially acceptable with Sgt. Pepper. And she adds, the Mothers of Invention used props and visual aids to bring to rock a whole new element of art, theater, and audience participation, unquote. And one of the best articles I have seen on Frank Zappa was written by Mark Leviton, and says in part, Zappa's uh, dream shatterer is a powerful force. He calls drugs this generation's aphrodisiacs and claims that joining leftist organizations has become the equivalent of belonging to a car club in the 1950s. His skillful sense of alienation is shown well on the album Burned Winnie Sandwich, on which there is a live recording of a concert at the Royal Albert Hall in England. The police are getting people back to their seats after they have overflowed and one man in the balcony is screaming, 
take that uniform off, man, before it's too late, man. And Sapa waits a minute before answering. Everyone in this room is wearing a uniform, and don't kid yourselves. And he continues. Sapa may be hard on his own generation, but what he does to the preceding generation is a thing of perverse beauty. Brown Shoes is probably the best little opus ever penned by Zappa, and it is a devastating, depressing look at nearly everything. The opening lines describe a family eating TV dinners by a pool. The hip young son is growing a beard, which his sister is watching, and talks about his final year in school. Through a series of surrealistic sequences, Sapa condemns a world of secret hungers where every desire is hidden away in a drawer in a desk at the office. Mechanized sex, such as between a 13-year-old girl who knows how to nasty and a guy whose nose lights up when she bites his neck like a pinball machine. And finally returning to another scene of the family around the pool. The son, having now finished school, reflects in his voice the uselessness of it all, and the family vainly tries to convince itself that life is worth living and that they have some control over it. Brown shoes is perfection in lyrics and orchestration, and thoroughly a downer." Unquote. So now in the rest of the program I will bring you a few of the early compositions of Frank Zappa that he and some of his friends performed during those concerts of contemporary and experimental music in the Mount St. Mary's College in that spring of 1963. In between compositions, Frank Zappa explains some of his ideas and answers some questions from the audience. And the compositions you will hear are, first, piece number two, of Visual Music, 1957, for Jazz Ensemble and the 16mm Projector. Then, Piano Pieces from Opus number 5. Then, Collage number 1 for String Instruments. Then, two fragments of the prepared tape to be used in Opus 5. And finally, his then very controversial composition, Opus 5, for piano, tape recorder, and multiple orchestras.
still has an emulsion on it, which I scraped and mixed with different colors of ink and uh, uh, nail polish and anything I get my hands on to uh, make these colors on there. Some of it was with brush, some with pen, some with uh, a piece of wood, some with uh, an airbrush. And I had no idea what it was going to look like while I was doing it, because uh, it's, when you get something this big and you're painting it on film, it, there is really very little uh, relation to what it's going to look like when it's blown up that large onto the screen. You can't really tell what your action is going to be. So the whole thing, the film, was more or less improvised. And uh, it was put together uh, in a random fashion, just trying to uh, keep the most interesting parts of what I had shot and what I had painted. And the only thing that I put out of this is uh, certain dead spots. And the black leader, the, the quiet passages that were in the film were inserted there as spacers to uh, tone down the group while they're performing this. They're in there for a purpose. That's not the actual film that was wasted. Next piece, we're going to perform a set of variables one or any five instruments. A group of piano pieces taken from uh, the Opus 5 for four orchestras, which is actually a piece for, uh, in this case, the way it's been being performed tonight will be with three orchestral groups, the tape recorder and the piano. The, this is a piano uh, from that composition. Uh, it tends to be varied somewhat when the rest of the orchestra plays. Uh, the pianist will perform these fragments in any order he uh, feels uh, necessary. And one last really fun.
happening to fall together. So it was totally improvised. And I'll, and I'll play you a piece of music. Conducting 
the tape recorder, the strings, and the piano, and the Barry is conducting the woodwinds, and what you mean you're on key? Pete is conducting the, the uh, brass. <laughs> so, uh,
case it was improvised. And uh, <laughs> I uh, asked them to find different kind of sounds that they could make on their instruments, and some of them really came up with some nice uh, ideas. The, the signals that we were giving, I'll explain to you very simply. This means free improvisation, and the finger signals told the performers which of the fragments they were to uh, play at any given moment. And uh, anything else that we were doing while we were gyrating around here is all meant to convey some kind of meaning. Maybe they could just halfway guess what we meant. It was something that would encourage them to make a, a different kind of sound. No, I'm not trying to be far out. I'm not trying to be hysterical. All I, it's, it's, in a way, it's a quite a purely intellectual uh, thing on the Opus 5. Even though it may have sounded comical to a few of you, I can see we got a nice little laugh at the end of the piece. But the fact is that uh, there is quite a bit of thought when into putting that piece together. And it took me a long time to figure out how, how to make it as loose as it sounded. And that was the intention all along, to make it sound that way. Not to make it sound hysterical, because that's only your interpretation of it. Maybe somebody else is going to agree, but... You're, you're accusing me of being facetious, and I'm quite serious. Yeah, I'm, I'm not accusing you of being facetious. I, you, may have, you may have felt that that, that uh, induced a certain amount of hysteria in you. But, to me, when I hear that, the only thing that I can say is that's the way I've always wanted music to sound. <laughs> which are a certain type of organization, and if the improvisations are allowed at certain periods, specified on a schematic diagram, is that not organization? Well, where then is the structure? I mean, the structure is right on the... several times what the structure is and it is. No, I haven't been asked several times. Uh, uh, Dr. Duran asked me one time whether or not, what was the structure of the... Uh, the last piece that was played, the one in standard notation. The, do I have to tell you that's a sonata allegro? I mean, what difference does it make? It's got, it's got a shape to it. It's got a diagram that tells them when to play and when to be quiet and when to improvise. That's a structure. It doesn't have to be something that's been hanging around for five or six hundred years. music, and my own personal taste and what I listen to uh, 
do not include very much tonal music of that type. But I'll tell you what I do like. I am a great fan of rhythm and blues, and I like rock and roll. <coughs> and I like folk music. But I don't like uh, Schubert, and I don't like Brahms, and I don't like things like that. I don't like Beethoven a whole lot. <laughs> the first, the first, um, the first long playing album that I bought was the complete works of Edgar Varès, and I got that when I was about 14 years old, and that's what I grew up with musically. I had uh, didn't even have a record player before that, and I wasn't listening to the radio, so you might say that I kind of started out uh, on the wrong foot. But uh, that's the answer to his question. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, I would like a little more clarification for myself on your emphasization on your previous number before the last one. And uh, I think we all think of it, uh, emphasization in the terms of the jazz fields, where there's a set of key chord progression or a set. And uh, can you explain a little bit more about your emphasization? How they improvise? Well, it's very simple. Uh, they are just turned completely free. No, uh, no lead of any sort? Of no. Lead. Well, during the improvisation, uh, the actual improvisation sections, when they aren't reading anything at all, they're just instructed to go. Just, uh, just turn themselves completely free and uh, try and avoid tonal passages was the only thing that I said to them uh, during the rehearsal. And I think they pretty well did that. Now, let's say your improvisation number, that you're going to do it again. Yes. And you're going to come out possibly the same way as it is tonight. What instruction would you give to the group? Well, I may want it to come out approximately the same way it did tonight, but I don't see really how I could. Because in the first place, uh, it's, it's kind of a foolish uh, idea because after how I explained to you how the parts work, you just can't match the rhythms <clears throat> and you can't, uh, you can't duplicate the improvisations and you can't duplicate the spontaneity that you get. Well, I'm thinking in line with the jazz, of because improvisation is a wonderful thing. I like it. They had an idea of uh, what they were supposed to do before they started, too. I told them what not to play. I told them what I didn't want to hear. Uh, it may sound kind of tyrannical, but the idea was that uh, we have these con conductors up here who are actually helping to compose the piece. The conductor, in this instance, is more than a conductor. He's assistant composer. And I have the, the total say-so over the other com assistant composers over how I want it to sound. All I'm trying to do with this group in Opus 5 is make them create a piece of music on the spot the way I would like to have it played. See, that's the whole idea of it. And when we were rehearsing, I just explained to them I didn't want any uh, scale practicing, and I didn't want any fooling around of that uh, sort, uh, and uh, playing of little tunes in there, things like that. Yes? Can you compose, I guess, the best words you can use, uh, any other music in what we've heard tonight, any other uh, radical have I composed any other radical things? Well, I, I, I didn't mean it in that way. I <laughs> know, <laughs> <laughs> what we've heard tonight, have you done anything uh, very much different from this? Yes. Uh, can you explain anything else to me? Yeah. <laughs> I sold a record to Capitol <laughs> last, <laughs> last Friday. <laughs> and you'll hear it on KFWB by next Friday. It's a rock and roll song. <laughs> and uh, I make my living doing things like that. And it is quite a bit different than what you've heard tonight. The name of the song is A Big Surfer. You can all go out and buy it. And as I come to the end of this program that today was dedicated to a very brief survey of the early musical beginnings of what I consider is one of the most talented and pioneering figures of the rock revolution of the 1960s. The, in the early 1960s, experimental avant-garde composer Frank Zappa, 
later the founder and leader of the famed Mothers of Invention. And this has been your host and producer, Carlos Hagen. Thank you very much for your attention.